this week on Erotic Awakening, overcoming fears and power exchange, community picnic, and bedroom recordings. Welcome to Erotic Awakening, an exploration of all things erotic. If you are offended by adult topics or prohibited by law, we recommend you stop listening right now. This week, Patreon supporters received bonus content, including an audio recording that we did on navigating polyamory and power exchange. We did, we did. As Sorry, well as... I got lost. As well as a free version of the audiobook Polyamory Toolkit, free ebooks, exclusive chats, member only Discord access, and other content. For as little as $5 a month, you too can support the show and receive an ever expanding list of bonus content. With lots more to come, right? So head over to patreon.com slash erotic awakening. And, and thank, thank you, you to, to our, our latest, latest supporters. supporters. Wow, we did that in we Houston. Did it. That Yay. Awesome. Hi, Don. Hi, Dan. Today on the podcast, the first thing we're going to talk about, for those watching on the video, we will explain this strange studio that we are currently sitting in. <laughs> but we'll get to there in a moment. But first, on we are going to talk about, as a follower in a power exchange relationship, regardless of what term you use as a follower, mm -hmm. how do you overcome some of the fears that you might have going into power exchange. And let me start off by saying, well, what kind of fears would you have? And I guess, why would you have any fears going into a power exchange relationship at all? Well, as a follower, yeah. a lot of fears. I mean, I would assume that being a, a leader is just lickety split, yeah. right? <laughs> so, of course it is. But yeah, we'll talk about that later, right? Sure, absolutely. So, but as a follower, I mean, you're giving, or at least I was giving, total control to you. And I actually wrote an article, it was a Fat Life writing, and then it was put in a book of Joshua Ten Pennies mm -hmm. about being a slave with control issues. So I've known my whole life that I've had control issues. Okay. I like to be in charge, so I know what's happening. The problem is, is that I don't grow as a person when I'm the one in charge, mm -hmm. or at least back then, right? So things have kind of uh, changed a little bit over time, grown, changed, whatever. But there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear of feeling like people would expect me to give up my voice, like I had nothing to contribute, like you would be making all of these decisions. And, you know, we saw different types of power exchanged where I wouldn't, the follower wasn't allowed to make any decisions right. they were told what to eat what vitamins to take what you know when to eat how to you know wow all around food but so that was a fear right <laughs> being told what to eat so, so there's a lot of fear we've also seen followers that became that embraced it in such a way that they allowed them to become very passive human beings and that's certainly something you wouldn't be not thrilled about it as I well. I wouldn't be thrilled about that. Really worked for them. And of course, we've done a few shows on that, mm -hmm. right? We've talked to Katie and different people about that. But for me, I had a fear of being vulnerable. And for me to follow, for, for me, Dawn, to follow, I had to get to a place of surrender. Mm -hmm. And a place of surrender is very vulnerable for me. And with my past baggage, Dawn doesn't like to be vulnerable. Right. And Yet Dawn has a kink about being vulnerable and following and power exchange. And so put all that shit together. And, and certainly anybody <laughs> that knows me knows that I have... As a, as a leader of power exchange, I demand vulnerability. It's something, so mm -hmm. it's really key to not only how I lead, how I create growth, how I create a healthy environment, but it, like you said, it's also a kink of mine, right? I want, to, I want that feeling of being in control. Right, so I want to trust someone enough to surrender. I needed to be able to trust someone enough to surrender to be vulnerable enough to surrender, to show all of me, right? You know all of me and have done since the beginning. You're the only person that knows all of me. Mm -hmm. Very scary. That's a lot of power I'm giving yep. you, right? So how'd you get there? How do you get past that fear and get to that spot where you're okay surrendering 
being vulnerable, letting go of all those safety mechanisms that you've had built in. You know, after 22 years, I still fight some of those mechanisms sometimes, right? But nowhere near like it was. Certainly. But the universe kind of did us a favor at the beginning, and this does not happen to everyone, and I don't wish it to happen to everyone. Okay. But when you and I, before we turned into a couple, when we were still friends, Mm -hmm. I had a breakdown, I guess, after a workshop. And ended up sharing a lot with you that I had not shared with anyone before. Mm -hmm. And you didn't judge me for it. And you just listened and let me share all of that. So our trust, plus we'd known each other years before that, my trust started then. But over time, you've also proven that you're trustworthy. I I was going to say, is one of the things that allows you, allows a follower to be that vulnerable to get past that fear is that the leader is setting some kind of an example yeah yeah so there's a lot of that is it that you're setting an example or just that you're proving time and time and time again that you are trustworthy so does it mean that you're just giving out little bits to start with sometimes yeah okay all right yeah as a submissive right and i talk about this sometimes and how i define things can be very different than how other people define things or their experience my experience and how i define things was is at the beginning i was a submissive right i didn't even have a goal in being a total power exchange follower, Uh right? Whatever label you want to call that. I mean, it was cool and fun and naughty, but was that really a goal? I don't know. We were kind of being a very, what is that word? When you let things develop naturally. Instinctive or? No, we just used it yesterday. Now I can't think it. I think we used it like 20 times yesterday. Now I can't (laughs) think of the word. Yeah, we used it up. It'll pop into my head, right? But at the beginning, it was a lot of self-talk. Organic, thank there you. you. Go. But it was a lot of self-talk at the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of self-talk to make sure that, remember Dawn, this is the power you gave him. Remember Dawn, this is what you wanted. Remember when he did this, he came through and did this. You know, just a lot of self-talk, a lot of affirmations. Love, trust, faith. Holy cow, right? Mm-hmm. My big affirmation that I use. You know, all of that was into play as I was working with myself, trying to be okay with being that vulnerable. And then somewhere along the line, that stopped happening, that taking the moments to talk to myself and things like that. And things just started coming into a, yes, sir, and doing the thing. Yes, sir, doing the thing. And then later going, oh, I did the thing without thinking about it and without questioning myself and without questioning your motives and my motives and all that stuff. So it sounds like there's a an aspect of fake it till you make it there at the beginning. At the beginning, sometimes there is, but you were aware of that too. Yeah. We talked about that a lot. Yeah, I mean, there, there is this aspect of, and we've, we talk about this a lot as well, is that at the beginning, you just do it because it's, it's going to get you where you want to go. Mm-hmm. You start to trust the process, and eventually you, a, enough trust builds up that it just turns into faith. So that you just, like you said, you get to that spot where you don't have to think about it. You don't have to question my motives or that leader's motives anymore. You recognize it's just the way things go. And Mm -hmm. it's always worked out in the past, so I don't have to give it a lot of thought. I think it's particularly valuable as you continue to build those to have a leader that on occasion does make mistakes. Because leaders do make mistakes. How you handle it, and that's a story for another time, but how a leader handles mistakes is probably... I would guess something that can vastly increase your confidence in that leader. Depending how it's handled. (laughs) Well, sure. Depending how it's handled, right? And then you have to remember, well, we're all human. So, you know, leaders are growing people as well, just like followers. And sometimes, I mean, it absolutely helps when the leader has confidence. So you having confidence in yourself over time led me to developing confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. And once I developed that confidence in you and us and me, and it became a lot easier. And it kind of helps, 
that when you have that confidence and you and you see me stuttering mm-hmm. and you say obey and it makes me wet, <laughs> that helps. That helps. <laughs> sure, sure. So I, I understand that you posted the same question to the old Discord and some of our I, peoples responded as I well. I did, but can I ask you a question first? I was trying to avoid that, I but no, go were. ahead. I know you were. So, But you're really good at helping followers. I mean, that's one of your things. Mm-hmm. You are really good at helping followers find their confidence to follow. So how have you, over 22 years and two handfuls of people that have been your caller, maybe? I don't have time to count right now. But no, how, but, but I've seen them have fears as well. How do you help them with their fears, or or do you? I mean, I know how you helped me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not a matter of, it's really just giving them, I don't think of it from a fear-based perspective, but that's certainly what I'm doing. I just think of it as giving them permission to be their authentic selves, right? Mm. So you start off, you have a conversation with somebody, and you actually listen, and you, you let them know that you are interested and actually listening, and ask probing, deep questions. At least this is the way I roll. And I'm willing to share about myself equally as the other person, but to be a good listener. And each time they reveal a little vulnerability, a little bit of a fear, a little bit of a thing, you just accept it and say, okay, cool, I, I get that, I accept it, it's not a big deal because they're not, and you move on. It is a big deal to them, mind you. It is a huge deal. Huge. So a lot of times it's these these secrets, whether they're things that they're ashamed of or just sexual secrets or just things that they've held on tightly to for their whole life. I really cannot explain fully what it is that gives people their confidence that they can share these things with me, except for I am so willing and open to share my secrets mm. uh, as I don't have any, right? I'm, I, all my deep, dark, crappy things that I'm ashamed of, blah, 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 I'm, oh, yeah, here it is. It's, it's, it's right there. It's right there in front in of the me. Book. It's probably in the book. It's probably in the book. In a book or on a podcast. <laughs> no, not all of my secrets no. are on books yet. Uh, <laughs> trying to think if you know all my secrets. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> just don't look in the trunk. That's the important thing. No, so no. the key is it's a slow process. You demand nothing until they're ready to be demanded of. Mm. Right. At first, you ex- you are simply willing to receive, and you slowly receive these ideas, these things that people are clinging tightly to, and they give you a little more and a little more, and they see that you're not accepting, responding poorly to them. Right. It does help, and I will say it helps me a lot that vulnerability is one of my kinks. So you know. So you know how to draw it out. I know how to draw it out, yeah. but also if somebody says, you know, I've never told anybody, but I've got this big fetish about doing it in the back seat of vans right i then don't have a fetish for doing it in the back seat of vans but the fact that you've got a vulnerability and it's it's something that you've shared with me now it's a fetish of mine too or it's a fetish with you at least oh i was gonna say at least for the moment but with them right that makes sense yeah so that and sometimes they actually key on shit that is well fuck that is exciting as hell i do have a new fetish now I just didn't know about it now that you've shared about it. Well, look at this new thing I've got. Nice, nice. So sometimes, I wanted to point out, sometimes fear can feel and look like resistance as well. So I want to talk about that at some point, not Mm -hmm. necessarily right now, because we do want to get to these other answers. But I do want to talk about resistance, or at least the look of that on the outside, because that can put leaders on the defensive. Yeah. And that's... they think it is resistance and... No. And I agree that that's a separate topic with that we should address, which is good. It's, it's also the same topic, but we're going to address it from the perspective of as a leader, how do you deal with that resistance? When you say you can trust me and the person says, no, I don't think so. I'm not willing to trust you today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's probably an underlying fear. It, yeah. But it, to, to the leader, it feels like they're just resisting my orders. Right. So how do how you get past that? Absolutely. So we will talk about that. Yeah. So some of these comments that you heard about yes. fear, how, overcoming fear from people on the old Discord. We did. So I threw out this as a question of the day on Discord, and I love the internet action that goes mm-hmm. with, our, with our listeners and followers and some patrons and things like that on Discord. And basically, they kind of had the same thing to say. It was actually really kind of cool. So one spoke out and said, oh, 
they said something that I forgot to mention, which is awesome. Time, trust, and a ton of courage. Mm. Courage really is that first step. Getting past the insecurities and trusting of Sir and themselves, right? So, right. And then what they get from Sir is the positive reinforcement. Good. So the more that they get of that, the more they learn to trust and to trust themselves, right? Yeah. I forgot about that part. I talked about trusting you, but trusting myself. Right. Ooh, that's a big one to look at, right? So. And I love the fact that they mentioned courage. I think courage is a great one to mention there as well. Mm-hmm. And then someone else spoke up and also said building trust taken them almost three years to get to where they're vulnerable enough to trust trust each trust each other slow process and then they use a lot of affirmations which i thought was cool yeah. because i definitely have mine and they said i started saying affirmations regu- regularly i hate that word i can't say it to remind my brain that i'm in a safe place mm. See, I get that. I totally get that, right? So very hard to be vulnerable if you're not feeling safe. And if you never knew what a safe place felt like, now you have to learn what a safe place feels like so that you can be vulnerable. Totally makes sense. So great stuff. If you've got any feedback, what makes you feel safe, feel free to head over to the Erotic Awakening Discord, find that question of the day, and share it there. Alternatively, you could share it with us in person if... You are in Texas, Toronto, Pennsylvania, Detroit, Kansas City, Chicago, Tulsa, or Minnesota. Keep up with all of our events, book news and discounts, and more via the Erotic Awakening newsletter, which July's will be out soon. And (laughs) even better, get your EA shout-outs like Katie from Illinois. And Susan from Missouri. Head over to eroticawakening.com and subscribe today. Awesome. So... We got to do something exciting. So we're, some of you guys have heard that we are, I love how you worded this. We're in Columbus, Ohio, resetting. Mm-hmm. So I love that word. So most of you have heard that we were in an accident about six weeks ago and kind of totaled the truck and the trailer. So truck's been replaced, trailer, we're working on it, but we're in Columbus, Ohio while we're doing this. Right, and this is where we spent the, the previous 20 years before we started the RV lifestyle. Right. So, of course, we know a lot of people. We've been involved in the community here, both as creators of things in the area, as well as participants in many things in the area. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we know a lot of people here. We do, though we haven't been able to see them. For one, we've been on the road the last two years, and we've stopped by a couple of times quickly. And for two, COVID for the last three years. Right. So there's some people we haven't seen in a while. So we had the opportunity just this past Sunday. We went to the annual community picnic. It is not any particular group that puts it on. It is a mixture of all the groups here in Columbus, Ohio. There was, I don't know, 60, 80 people there, something like that. Yeah, for the four hours it was going on, yeah, at least that many. And it has been going on for 22, 23 years now, so that's pretty fantastic. And we got to see, some. now we've lost some leather elders, but Mm -hmm. some that are still around. We got to see some leather elders that were well enough to come out and, and say hi to people. So that was really cool. We got to say hi to the person. If you've read Living MS, if you've read, if you've heard of us talk about contracts, the person that advised us to put the clause in dissolution. The, the dissolution clause, she showed up. Yep. So that was really nice to see her. So, yeah. Yeah, that was very cool. And we got to see podcast listeners like Joyful Wish and a few others. Indeed. And a lot of new faces. A lot of people found kink while they were trapped in their houses with just the internet to play with. So they're coming out to to meet people. So if that was great to lots of good food and a puppy dog and yeah. Absolutely. I ate way too much. (laughs) One of the things that was asked of us recently is what prompted us to go on on the road in the first place. Yeah, we had a patron reach out and ask us the question. So we're going to start off by, so I want to explain a little bit about this. If you are again watching the video, this interesting video studio that we're in is actually an extended stay bedroom. <laughs> As Dawn just mentioned, we lost the truck in the RV in an accident. But we didn't lose our mattress. No, this is our actual RV. mattress from the RV behind us. It's a very nice mattress. Nice mattress. <laughs> Both of us don't have back issues with this mattress. Yeah, it's insanely cool. I should probably plug the company. <laughs> but anyway, so we are in the midst of, we've replaced the truck, we've replaced, we're about... 50%, 60, 70% 
of replacing the RV if everything goes well. We we're know what's your model. We know what we know what we want. We're waiting for it to be delivered so that we can actually look at it. Right. So, but that leaves us in an extended stay for um, again, and this is going to be the fifth hotel, sixth hotel since May nineteenth that we've been in. It's a little bit of a challenge there, but of course, as we hit this spot where we've lost the RV, we've lost the truck, we get to have this conversation. Do we want to go back on the road? We've been doing mm-hmm. it. How long were we on the road? Two years, almost exactly. It's right now. It's two years. Ah, it's so hard July to believe it's been two years already. Twenty twenty three. And we thought, well, do we want to go back on the road? So we thought, well, why did we go on the road in the first place? Now, the reason we went on the road in the first place was just more of a why not than anything else. It was a perfect storm, right? Mm-hmm. We had lost the space. We had lost that. Mm-hmm. You, Because of COVID, you were able to work from home. We didn't really like the condo that we were in. And now that we had lost our offices at the space, all that stuff came home to this little itty bitty condo that we had just gotten. So we weren't happy with that. We we weren't, nothing you know, was tying us here. I think it started because one of the reasons we picked the condo that we had was at the time we were putting in, I don't know, another Lots of hours. 20, 30 hours <laughs> at the Columbus space, which was the community center we were part of running. The condo was very close to the community right. to the community center, so it made a lot of sense. So we got the thinking. Well, there's really no reason for us to keep this condo because it, the location's no longer convenient. It's totally. It's just there's no value in the particular location. We did a little bit of house shopping and found that houses were. This oh, is the, that's right. Yeah. Perfect storm, right? This is the part where the house market's going nuts, which I probably still is. But it was at its peak of going nuts so much so that. We'd the, only owned the condo a year. The, the condo that we bought a year ago, we were offered 30% more than we paid for it a year earlier. So, again, like you said, perfect storm, we said, and we were just sitting around chatting with right. some friends. Right. And I don't know how it even came up, this whole idea of why don't we just sell everything and go on the road. Yeah, and we did that Memorial Day weekend of 2021 and we had everything sold and the truck and trailer bought by July of 2021. And, and we hit the road. And it's super hard for me to give you a very a clean why reason more. It's, it is very much more of a why not. We, if not now, when was one of our big drivers on that? We had just lost Bat and realized all the stuff that she hadn't been able to do. I think really that was part of my thought, right? That whole, like you said, if not now when Mm -hmm. this is perfect timing you want to talk about fear at least on my part right so because dan's a minimalist i'm not so to get rid of everything oh plus big d had just hit the road Mm -hmm. and i saw that they had done it and were having a blast we'd actually talked to some other we've interviewed some people on the podcast a few months before that or maybe at right around that same time who just happened to live in, in an RV. And we just happened to be, oh, that's kind of crazy. What do you do that? And they, they talked a little bit about it. And, and it was literally boom, 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 boom. And it was so easy to make happen. Like the next step is like, oh my God, what's the next step? Universe said, boom, here it is. And let me make it easy. Yeah. And we did the thing. And we're like, what's the next step? And then boom, here it is. And let me make it easy. And it's like, well, and, I guess we're doing this. And, <laughs> And we went, and just for on a lark, we went to go look at RVs, and we weren't bothered by any salesmen, and we just wandered around and looking at RVs and saw how, compared to condos and houses, how cheap they were, and we said, fuck it, let's do it, yeah. and boom. And oh, and then that's where, so one of the easy things was, is that you had decided on a floor plan, but there was no dealers around here of that maker, right? And we decided we wanted used but not too used and RVs were like impossible to find at that point and RV produ- makers weren't pumping them out fast enough and then we went camping with friends and I looked at RV Trader and boom there it is one year old 20 minutes from us mm-hmm. we left the people we were camping with drove 20 minutes away walked through it put a deposit on it so that is a very long answer <laughs> to the question why did we decide to do it why not the, the big driver will come back to, if not now, when? And certainly the the worst case scenario is we hate it. And okay. But we, we don't. 
and we sell the stuff, we move into an apartment. Nothing, well, a little bit of a financial hit, sure, but why not? And we happen to love it. We love it enough that now that we lost the RV and we had the opportunity to come off the road after two years, we like, hell no, we're getting a bigger, better RV. Yeah, so we've been in Columbus now for five weeks, except the week we took on the cruise. And we love our people here. We love the place here. But it'll be fun to get back on the road again and get to events. And the fun part is some of you listeners right now are going, well, we got to meet you because you came to this area, that area, as we travel through the nation. And we continue to keep doing that. And yeah, South Dakota and and South Carolina and Florida and like all the places. Yeah, it's been awesome. Do you know what, though? If someone asked me, what did you expect to happen that didn't happen? In the last two years while you were on the road, I thought we were going to be super sluts. Very true. Did not happen. Not for lack of trying. Oh, we don't try that hard. We don't try. We're bad swingers, but I thought we were going to make it work this time. (sighs) That's okay. I'll keep trying. Anyway. (laughs) Take a moment to support the podcast. Rate us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Or just tell your friends. Feel free to reach out to us. We love interacting with you. Contact us with questions, podcast comments, or just to say hi. You can find us on FetLife as Dan and Dawn. We're Erotic Awakening on Instagram. Use the links from the Erotic Awakening website, that brand new fancy website that I just built, for Discord, Facebook, and everything else in the world. Or just email us at Dan and Dawn at eroticawakening.com. Bye, Dawn. Bye, Dan.